Welcome to another tutorial from Digital Arts Entertainment. In today's episode, I'm going to look, take a look at level decoration and how you can do that inside of Unreal Engine. My name is Dries de Rijkre and I'm a teacher at Digital Arts Entertainment as well. And I'm going to uh, give you guys a tour of Unreal Engine. Uh, and you can see this kind of as a starter guide to some uh, introduction settings to Unreal Engine, uh, how to set up a quick project, how to get started uh, with creating levels inside of Unreal Engine. We're going to mainly focus on lighting, on atmosphere, on how you can make sure your materials look good. Um, I'm going to give you some interesting settings uh, regarding lighting. I'm not going to go that deep into materials, um, but we're going to get a nice little scene together uh, and I'm going to show you some neat tips and tricks that we can start with. We're going to start off uh, by downloading and opening uh, the Epic Games Launcher and I already have it installed, of course. Um, and we're going to, of course, take a look at um, what we have right here. So uh, you can see that when you go to the Epic Games Launcher and you've got a new engine, you can uh, go ahead and click on library and download different engine versions right here. If you want to create a new version, you just click on the plus icon here, select whatever version you want. I'm of course going to work with the latest version 4.26 um, and we're going to go ahead and launch that. So Unreal Engine is made up of a whole bunch of interesting facets. Um, we've got a whole bunch of so Unreal Engine is made up of a whole bunch of interesting parts. Uh, we've got these packages here that we can use and we can uh, download them from the marketplace. There's a lot of those free packages out there. We're also going to use one of those free packages, namely the uh, Iceland Volume 2 package. So you can go ahead and download that as well. Uh, you can find those in the marketplace under the free section. Right here, you've got free and you've got all the different uh, sections from the free uh, from the free category right here. Uh, Megascans is of course a part of that and you can use uh, Megascans Bridge, um, Quixel Bridge to download Megascans assets directly into Unreal Engine. Uh, but for now, we're just gonna use that pack because it uh, comes with a lot of interesting assets that we can then just play around with. But you can definitely just uh, use these uh, packs or the Quixel Bridge. Next to that, there's a lot of Epic Games content on here as well, stuff that is free from Epic Games, like for example, the recently released MetaHumans, uh, but also stuff like uh, the Edit Finch assets are also available, but also the characters from the Paragon uh, series are also here, or if you need icons for your game. And these are all free to use, so uh, I highly recommend you take a look at that before you start making all your assets yourself. There's also a permanently free collection and a free for the month collection um, if you need to find some other materials that are not part of Unreal or Quixel. Do make sure you keep an eye out for the free of the month uh, category right here. Every month there's some free assets that you can just download and then use forever. So I highly recommend uh, you get those. You can see that our Unreal Engine project has started up. When you want to create a new Unreal project, um, we're going to start off by uh, showing you how you can make sure... I'm going to start off by showing you how you can make sure that you have some interaction with your environment. Um, and we're going to start off by clicking on games right here. We're going to use the first person template and we're going to um, modify that one a little bit just so we can uh, install or uh, just so we can use um, the first person mechanics without the gun because we don't need that one right now. Um, and so we have a little bit of a sense of scale and that we can walk around in our scene as well. You select a location for your project to be saved. I'm just going to save that inside of our desktop right now. There we go. And then rename this to example. Right here in our project settings, we're going to ch uh, check Blueprint because we're not going to code in C++ today. Uh, we're going to ch check maximum quality. Um, I'm going to keep ray tracing disabled for now because not all of you, of course, have uh, ray tracing. And because I want to show you some cool lighting uh, features with uh, without ray tracing because you can still make things look really good without ray tracing. Um, you can keep starter content off for now because we're going to insert our own pack later. Uh, but there's some interesting assets here for starter content if you want to mess around with that. And then, of, of course, we're going to keep it to desktop console and create the project. It's going to set up everything for us. It's going to use that template and uh, get us started.
All right, the project has opened up. And if we press play, you can see that we are just this uh, character. Um, I'm gonna mute my sound for a second here. Um, so when we press play, we are this character and we can walk around, we can shoot the balls. Now, of course, uh, we don't have a lot of use for this, so we're gonna just gonna play. You can do that by going to blueprints, clicking on your first person character. This is gonna open up the blueprint editor for our first person character. And we're just gonna start deleting some stuff that we don't need. If we go to the viewport section right here, we're gonna open up the 3D view. And to uh, rotate your camera here, you can hold Alt and left click to orbit your camera around, or you can just hold right click and WASD to move around your C. You can also use Q and E while holding right click to uh, move your camera up and down. You can also scroll your mouse wheel while holding right click to move the camera speed up or down so you have more control over where you're going. So obviously we don't need this gun, so we're just going to select it and delete it. We're going to select that gun and delete it as well. We don't need the arms, so get rid of that. Um, there's a bunch of trackers here that we don't need, so just select them and delete them. Uh, and then we're going to click Compile. And it's going to throw a bunch of errors because we, of course, just deleted a bunch of random stuff that we're not using anymore. Um, and we're just going to say, <laughs> go ahead and delete whatever's complaining. Uh, you can just click here on Target and then it's going to select the uh, nodes that are complaining. And we're just simply going to delete all the nodes that uh, are complaining until there's no more nodes that complain. There you go. So if we now press play, you can see that we are just this character that can still walk around because we haven't destroyed that logic yet. Uh, we just got rid of the arms and the gun. Uh, you can still jump as well, and we can uh, not shoot anymore because we got rid of that. But we still have this reticule in the center of our screen. So how can we get rid of that? Um, or you can just delete the first person HUD uh, blueprint here. Um, or what you can also do is you can go to the HUD input here inside of the blueprint and delete that. Um, you can find that uh, right here. Um, no. So we're just going to go to our first person hut here and we're going to um, delete that basically. Um, we're just going to say no more drawing of your hut. Just get rid of that and then it's not going to do that anymore. As you can see, our crosshair is gone. We're just uh, destroying some parts that we don't need, so it's not cluttering up our scene. This gives us also uh, a starter map that we can mess around with underneath first person. And then we've got uh, the map right here that we can see. Um, so the first person template also gives us a map that we can mess around with, but of course we're not gonna use uh, this one. We're gonna create our own little map uh, that we can see some uh, results in. Let's start off by just creating that new map. So let's go here into our content browser. You can see that on the bottom here, you've got a whole bunch of different folders and assets here that we can click around in. Um, and that can show us different assets, for example, the animations of our arms uh, for when we're shooting, uh, but also the mesh for the, ar for the gun and stuff like that the mesh for the arms, the materials and stuff like that. So we don't really need to use that right now. We're going to use our own folders and uh, put our own stuff in there. So you can see here under the resources panel, uh, sorry, under the content browser, you can see you can open up the resources panel on the left hand side here. This gives us a nice tree structure that we can work with. We're going to go into the root folder, the content folder. Every Unreal project has a root folder called a content folder. And we can just uh, Right click, create a new folder, and we're going to create a new folder called maps. Um, and this is just going to contain all our different maps or levels uh, that we work with. Let's right click, create a new level. We're going to call this example level. You can call it whatever you want, of course. And we're going to open this up and save the original level that we were in. And this is going to open up a, compl a completely empty level with nothing in it, which is exactly what we want. And we're going to start off by creating some volumes that we can then use uh, to decorate our scene with. Um, so I'm going to start off by creating a uh, BSP uh, volume. A BSP volume is a sort of mesh that is generated according to the volume that you give it. Um, and if we would duplicate that and put different volumes into each other, let me uh, change the, blending, the render mode to unlit by hitting Alt 3 on my keyboard. Um, you can see if I have these different meshes inside of each other, it's not like it's just two cubes that are intersecting because 
you can see the mesh is actually being generated according to this uh, volume right here. So we can uh, we'll get rid of that version right there. I'm gonna take this box, put it in the center of my scene by hitting the yellow arrow on the right hand side here next to location. And we're going to um, give this a bit of a size. I'm not going to scale it because if I do that, you can see I am scaling the textures on it, which is not a good idea. Um, I'm going to change the actual geometry of this. Um, so with this BSP brush in my scene, I can scroll down a bit here and change the brush, brush settings from 200 to maybe uh, 2K by 2K, 2000 by 2000, which would be 20 meters by 20 meters. Um, and then if I hit play, um, you see I have no light, so I can't really see. So we're going to, all right, so right now we have uh, this box right here that we can technically walk around on, but we don't have any light in our scene yet. We're set to, uh, to unlit, so we can't see anything yet. So if I change this to back to lit by hitting Alt-4, or you have this little menu right here on your uh, keyboard, uh, on your screen, you can change this to lit, so you have no light. Let's start off by just putting a single light in our scene so we can actually see something. We can go to lights, directional light and just drag and drop that into your scene. All right, that gives us a bit of a sunlight and let's actually add some boxes as well so we can actually see something, uh, see how the shadows react and so forth. So we can put a box in our scene. You can just drag it from the basic tab into your scene. Um, before we do anything uh, like that, though, we're going to um, place these assets actually perfectly on the ground. But instead of trying to um, do that with like the arrow and trying to get it perfectly straight, what we can do is uh, we just hover it above our volume right here and we hit end on our keyboard. And that's just gonna snap it to the ground. Now we can put some of these boxes around like that. Maybe put another box on top of it. You can copy things by holding Alt while you drag them around. There you go. I've got a little stack of boxes here. And um, so let's hit play and maybe walk around a bit. You're gonna notice that we can walk around and we can actually push these boxes. Uh, well, we can walk around, but we can't push these boxes because um, we still haven't activated physics for them. So we're gonna select the boxes here and scroll down to uh, uh, physics right here and turn on simulate physics. And that's gonna give us the ability to uh, push these boxes around. So that's uh, already a bit of a start. Um, to get a little bit of interactivity in the, into the scene. You can also notice that our uh, sunlight, that directional light that we put on here, um, has this preview inside of its shadows. This is because it's currently set to stationary. If we set this to movable, you can see this preview uh, icon disappears. Now, do be careful. Um, stationary means it's, it's set to preview because we still need to bake our light. What I'm gonna show you today is uh, purely dynamic light. I'm not gonna get into baking uh, just yet, but um, if we set all of our lights to movable, they are always completely dynamic, um, which allows us to change them in real time. But do keep in mind, uh, this is a much more uh, performance intensive. So if you're making an optimized game, definitely take a look at baking your lights. Don't make everything movable. Uh, but for this example, we are gonna make everything movable. So set that to movable. I'm gonna turn off my snapping of my rotation by clicking this uh, button right here. Also the grid snapping, gonna turn it off. Also the scale snapping. Um, and you can move your light around a bit so you have a bit of uh, variation. Okay, um, this is a very simple 3D scene. We have a light, we have some boxes, but that's it. We have no bounce light. We don't have any environment going on. Um, that's a start, um, but we still need to spice this up by quite a bit, of course. I'm gonna start off by adding a few extra uh, volumes into my scene so I can actually have a bit of variation. So I'm gonna add this box here. I'm not really gonna give it a wall. And instead of using the brush settings here to give it uh, a size, you can also change your mode uh, from the place mode uh, to the, um, to the uh, edit mode, right? We can uh, edit these volumes. You can do that here under modes and change it to brush editing. You can also do this by holding shift four on your keyboard. Now I can actually uh, select the surfaces of these uh, volumes, move them around, create um, the exact shape that I want to. So I'm just gonna create a little bit of a shape here just to give some extra dimension, some extra volume, some shadows. I'm gonna take this brush right here, 
move it around a bit. I'm going to turn on my angle snapping. There we go. Now, of course, I'm just making a box, uh, but this is, of course, just for demonstration purposes. If you're making an actual level, don't just make boxes. Uh, but we're just making a very simple shape for now that we're then gonna fill up with assets. It's more about how uh, these assets look, how the lighting interacts with everything. It's not about uh, the level design uh, directly. So um, I have this large shadow here that is just hitting this wall on the left-hand side, but there's no uh, any form of global illumination. It's just completely black. Uh, it's just direct light and nothing else. How can I fake this global illumination? We do this with a skylight, of course. We drag a skylight into our scene. Um, and you're going to notice that's going to do a lot because a skylight, when you drag it into your scene, it is going to uh, capture the scene around it and try to make uh, a uh, cube map from that and fill in the light uh, of your scene using an HDR in HDRI. But the problem uh, with that is uh, currently it can't capture a cube map because there is no baked lighting anywhere. Uh, it doesn't capture any uh, movable lighting. So right now it's just capturing a black cube map and using that as a light, which doesn't give us anything, of course. Um, so we could plug in our own source type or what we can also do is we can just give our scene an atmosphere and use that instead. And we can do that by going to our visual effects and then here, clicking here on Sky Atmosphere. You can just drag that into your scene. And that's also not going to do anything. Because we forgot something important, we still need to tell our game engine that the directional light that we put into our scene earlier, this one right here, that this is the actual sun. So you can do that by moving down in the menu here and turning on Atmosphere Sunlight under Atmosphere and Cloud. You can also just search for that here under Search Details. If I just type in Sun, it's going to show up very quickly as well. I highly recommend you mess around with this uh, Details search uh, bar right here because it's really handy to find uh, different settings here. Also remember, scrolling can be done by, instead of scrolling, just holding right-click and basically flicking through the menus, which can um, go really quickly if you are... Uh, go, you can get really uh, fast with that if you are used to uh, working with this system. So turn on atmosphere to sunlight and you can see we now have a beautiful sun in our sky that is going to, I'm going to get rid of this tab right here, that is going to um, give us a nice blue sky. You can see we still don't have any kind of reflections here. So what is going on? Well, we have to still tell our skylight to update uh, the scene. So if you click on recapture, it's going to capture um, the sky and it's going to show that in our scene. It's still gonna say, hey, you need to rebuild your lighting because our skylight is currently set to stationary. Every time it's set to stationary, you gotta bake your light. But uh, let's not do that. Let's set it to movable. Let's make it completely dynamic. Cool part here is um, we can also turn on real-time capture. This was something new that was added to 4.26. And if you turn that on, it's going to update um, the skylight. Not every frame, but rather fast. And you can see if we change our light right here, and let me turn off the snapping, um, and we put the sun higher in the sky, right? Our uh, global illumination is gonna turn a bit more blue. If we put it down low, you can see that the skylight is updating the colors to reflect the uh, color of the sky. All right, let's put our light downwards a bit more. And it's still saying that we need to rebuild our light even though we don't have um, even though we don't have any uh, stationary objects. Turns out I just needed to build my reflection captures. Um, all right, so we've got a skylight, we've got a directional light. Very straightforward. I'm pretty sure if, um, if you already know something about Unreal Engine that you've already done this before and we can still walk around on our scene and see what is what. Um, so nothing special here. But 
let's spice this up quite a bit so we can start adding uh, much more interesting details uh, to our scene. And before we start actually adding anything special lighting wise, I'm just going to dress up my scene a bit with assets from an asset pack so we can see what effect this has on uh, more than just a bunch of cubes in a scene. So let's save that. Let's close our editor and let's actually install that asset pack under library and I've already downloaded uh, the Iceland volume 2 right here. I'm just going to add that to the example project that we just made. All right, we've managed to. All right, we've managed to install our asset pack. You can see that here under Megascans 2K and 4K. You can find all the assets that you need in here. Now, instead of like going into the individual folders, which would be an extreme hassle, of course, we can just click on the folder itself and then turn on a um, static mesh filter right here. So we can see all the static meshes that are inside that folder. So let's go ahead and put some actual assets into the scene to fill this up a bit, um, to fill this up with some assets so we can actually have an interesting scene to light. And if you're having weird issues with some of the LEDs popping in size, um, the, so the, the reason why this is now popping in size is because there's a, an LOD problem. Um, because 
one LOD is bigger than the other. I think this is a problem with the asset pack. I've encountered a problem like this before. Uh, but to fix that, uh, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna tell the engine to always use LOD zero uh, for now. Normally would go into the actual LOD and fix that. Uh, but uh, if you're having issues like that, what you can do to quickly fix that is just to uh, press the tilde key on your keyboard to open up the console command and then hit R dot force LOD uh, and then space zero. And that's just gonna lock all the LEDs to zero. So that problem is fixed. some reason
And we're going to top off our scene. So I've placed some assets together here. Um, just going to ignore the backside of uh, this part here. Let me just copy some extra rocks on the back here. So it's just filled up a bit more. We're, we're just going to ignore that part of the scene. It's going to fill up one side so we can uh, see what kind of effect the lighting uh, tips are going to have on our scene. So I'm just going to place this one in a wall here. Just get rid of that wall for now. Same for the other one. Now normally you would add uh, some extra foliage to this and other small tits and tats to make this much more interesting. Uh, but we already have a bit of a scene here together. I still need to fill, fill up these uh, seams here where uh, rocks intersect with my floor. Um, things I could add for that would be like these kind of assets where you've got uh, a bit of extra moss that is there to uh, blend that a bit more together or um, create some more noise to distract from the fact that there's a giant seam right there. Um, other things that can help are, for example, these piles of rocks are really handy for that. You just scale them up a bit, rotate them, and then you can blend that up uh, just a bit more like that. Another good tip is to just go to Alt 3, so it goes to uh, Unlit, gives you a bit more uh, visual indication on where things are intersecting so you don't have to take care into take into account your light because right now the light doesn't look good and whatever we place in it is not going to look good no matter what we do with it uh, if we go to all three we have more of an idea of what the colors of our scene are and it gives us a bit more capability in, in trying to blend things uh, together so you can see there's quite a harsh intersect between the different rocks here so i might have to be careful with uh, whatever i'm trying to do here But always make sure that your entire scene feels as if it's kind of made out of one asset. If you have the feeling that there's multiple assets, like really visible, uh, try to reevaluate some parts or maybe uh, try to hide that a bit more by uh, hiding that with extra bricks or assets or other uh, parts. Okay. Cool, uh, you can hit, can hit G to hide your icons and um, we're, let's add some extra lighting effects into our scene. So right now um, I have like this large brick on top here uh, just to create a bit more of an extra dimension. And uh, I'm gonna add a bit of a focal point in the center here uh, because I have this nice cool piece uh, of volcanic rock, basically that, that forms this small tower we're gonna use that as a bit of a focal point of this uh, dead corner right here uh, where light can shine uh, onto. Now let's make sure it doesn't stick out that much and we're gonna have to add a few other small assets around it so it blends a bit more with the environment because right now it's just very harshly put in there but we have to still create kind of the feeling that uh, maybe some lava spilled into this area and then dried up well not dried up it cooled down and created this rock formation right so of course this doesn't mean a lot right now because there's like no interesting lighting but if we change our lighting we can very quickly create something interesting we're going to start off by uh placing all of our lighting icons here close in the center of our scene so we have good uh, it's easy to, to change it and easy to select them now we're gonna go ahead and take our exposure and lock it because if we have a variable exposure exposure it's a bit hard to uh, change the values of our light and then uh, actually see what's going on because variable exposure can uh, be a bit dangerous here so you can lock it by turning off game settings so it doesn't show the exposure value of your game and just locking that to zero um, so that gives us the uh, exposure value of our main light basically and if we want the sun to be a bit brighter here 
so it makes more sense that you should absolutely do that uh, but absolutely lock your exposure because you don't want to be lighting a scene where the exposure changes all the time it's a bit hard to do okay and then um, give your uh, directional light a bit of a whirl S uh, select something that is interesting doesn't really matter that much as long as you have a good feeling about it um, Something that um, looks cool, doesn't necessarily look like super realistic uh, because it's easy to fall into the thing like, oh, it looks like a picture because of all the uh, assets that you have in your scene, they are photo scanned. So it's easy to fall into that trap. You still have to make your scene look cool, right? Uh, so let's mix up, pick something a bit more like this where we have a bit more of that uh, back and rim light that's falling on there. Um, and maybe make that a bit more interesting by having the actual light fall on there. And then we can uh, mess around with that light a bit later. Now, one extra thing that is happening right now is the lighting of our sky is not very realistic because it's just completely blue. Um, usually the sky has clouds in it, right? So let's add some clouds and you're gonna immediately uh, see that the uh, reflection capture of our sky is gonna be very heavily affected by that. Um, and you can see that by going to your visual effects and then uh, putting some volumetric clouds into your scene. You can see like how much brighter instantly your scene becomes because of those volumetric clouds in there. So put that in there. You can see the uh, sky uh, light updating. And uh, you can also see that these clouds can look pretty cool if you have like some low lights on there. And um, what I then like to do is um, I like to mess around with my skylight, with my directional light a bit, um, in the sense that I like to make the intensity of my directional light not that harsh, put it down a bit, because I like to work with spotlights to enhance certain areas of my scene. Um, so, for example, um, let's say that we want to uh, put this as the main area of our, uh, the main light of our scene. What I'm usually gonna do is either you have your directional light that falls on top of it, which is okay, but then definitely turn down the amount of directional light that is falling on it. Or I put my directional light a bit more to the side, so there's not as much light falling on it directly, maybe on other parts of my scene, just to give it a bit more of a realistic feel, but not directly on the object itself because um, I'm gonna then use those spotlights to enhance that by quite a bit. So um, remember your spotlights, they are very important when lighting any environment. Um, try to stay away from point lights. Spotlights are six times cheaper than point lights. So for one point light, you could should have could have just used six point uh, spotlights. Um, so I highly recommend using those instead. Definitely when you're baking your scene, it doesn't really matter. Then you can just bake everything down into your uh, lighting map but if your all your light needs to be movable for some reason or another uh, definitely use spotlights instead of point lights they are a lot cheaper and then also definitely turn off cast shadows because that is also very performance intensive and now we can um, go ahead and you can see here i've got my spotlight i'm actually going to use this to create a very painterly feel in my scene where i uh, highlight the objects that are important and uh, create the composition of this area uh, a little bit um, so i'm going to put the spotlight here increase the intensity um, by quite a bit and then get that fake rim light in there and really the name of the game is fake it till you make it it really doesn't matter if it doesn't look like uh, super, super realistic, as long as it looks super cool. Um, that's mainly what's uh, the point here. Um, you can mess around with your attenuation radius. So if I hit G here, you can kind of see what this uh, spotlight is doing. Um, I can mess around with my angle and my attenuation radius. So it just only focuses on that part right here. And uh, these spotlights are also very, very important when we're talking about... Um, so try to keep these values as low as possible to help with performance. And these are very important, these spot lights, when we're talking about uh, creating the feeling that there's light breaking through the clouds and uh, lighting certain areas of like large landscapes. That's also a very important part of that. So uh, let's not turn down the light too much, actually make it kind of bright. So it's interesting. Now we're going to use these spotlights to uh, light different parts and key parts of our uh, scene. Even uh, faking the bounce light of the sun on the ground, maybe. Um, definitely not unimportant. We're going to make this just a little bit greener. 
because it's falling on top of this uh, moss right here. Let's not make it as bright. I'm gonna put that on here and also put a little bit on there. And definitely put some extra on here. All right, you can see that these spotlights have quite a big impact on the readability of your scene, right? Um, so try to highlight important parts of your scene. We are naturally drawn to light, definitely in dark areas. Uh, and that's gonna help you uh, create the scene with a bit more readability. Now it's still quite noisy and you can see that our skylight, as you can see here, let's select that skylight. Um, if we turn that on and off, you're gonna see a big effect, of course, because um, you can see it has, uh, it's creating all of this global illumination, but it doesn't take into account any assets, right? It doesn't cast any shadow, it's just uh, adding uh, the same amount of light everywhere. So what I want is for these big rocks to definitely cast like kind of a shadow on the inside of this uh, area right here. And we're gonna do that with something called distance field ambient occlusion. And it's a very powerful tool uh, to create some very nice uh, soft shadows inside of cavities. It's not flawless and it can definitely break apart uh, in less organic environments where there's like a lot of walls that are very straight and, and don't have a lot of texture. Uh, you can kind of see artifacts there, but in noisy scenes like this, you're gonna see this is gonna create a lot of depth. And you can do that by um, going to your um, project settings under edit going to distance field just type distance field into the search bar and then turn on generate mesh distance fields so just turn that on restart your project and it's going to uh, generate these distance fields for our meshes and uh, it's going to use those distance fields to create sort of soft shadows and sh uh, soft ao uh, in our scene you can see it restarts pretty quickly um, and let's just open our map again You can see right here, it's uh, building those mesh distance fields. And um, you can already see that there, there's a, a quite a big difference in, and it's still, let me get rid of that. There's already a quite a big difference in the readability of the scene because uh, cavities like this are getting dark and uh, other cavities are, uh, or and, and large areas are getting a bit of that AO in there. And we can see that if we, uh, turn on and off cast shadows, you can see how much of an influence this distance field AO has. And let's make this even more intense if I put this large rock on top of it. Right? Uh, now, of course, my uh, spotlights don't make a lot of sense anymore if I do that. Let's actually just turn them off for now. I'm just gonna select them and turn off effects world. I'm not just gonna hide them. You can see how much of a, of a difference in uh, global illumination and ambient occlusion uh, that makes. Um, so, Distance field AO, really, really nice um, in creating these very cool, soft um, global illumination effects. All right, my scene is a bit dark right now, so let's go ahead and turn up that directional light. And let's just discard the spotlights for now. You can kind of see this uh, soft shadow effect increasing and decreasing as I get that rock closer and further away and it's completely real time so if i were to have this rock uh, and it's it's some kind of rock that can disappear or something or like maybe it collapses um, the global illumination is going to update right and it's going to increase or decrease the light in my scene uh, by quite a big factor so uh, very very nice uh, effect to have in there um, do be careful don't scale your stuff too much in a non-uniform way so not too much like in one axis or another because it can generate these weird effects with the global illumination um, so be careful when you're when you're doing that um, or if you're having artifacts it might be because of an object that has its global illumination uh, sorry it's uh it's non-uniformly scaled so keep that in mind um, so yes that's another thing the distance field global illumination and we can turn on and off 
and it has quite a big impact. And there's one extra thing that we can do, and that is um, screen space global illumination. And screen space global illumination is just a screen space effect, right? But you can see it has a very nice effect as it adds more global illumination to the scene, layering on top of what we already have. Um, and it fakes some uh, nice reflections, some nice um, reflections from our su uh, sunlight here onto those rocks. Let me demonstrate that even clearer by putting it right next to the ground here and upping the intensity. Um, you're going to see that um, our, if we, for example, place a sphere here, that there's quite a bit of, of light that gets reflected from the bottom here. But it's completely screen space, so if I move my uh, screen down or up, it's going to have a very big effect on the actual lighting in the scene. So uh, remember that it only renders what is visible on screen at that, mo at that moment. Okay, so those things together can create some really nice lighting effects. And we can make this even better, create a bit of a, of a god ray uh, effect here by uh, going ahead and using um, exponential height fog. And exponential height fog, you can find that in the um, visual effects setting and just drag that into your scene. And you can see if I delete that, what kind of effect that has. It basically creates a sort of exponential height. Um, so that means it it, it's it's height based. If I move this uh, icon up or down, you can see the amount of fog going up and down in the scene. Um, so basically this icon says where the fog should uh, begin and where it should end. Um, and if we increase the density, we're going to get more and less fog, of course. But what's interesting here is if we turn on volumetric fog. If we turn that on, we can start seeing um, these god rays from our sunlight appearing. And um, you can increase or decrease the intensity of uh, those god rays. Um, so if I change my fog density back to 0.02, I'm not going to have a lot of fog, so I'm not going to have a lot of god rays. But if I'm my directional light, I increase the volumetric scattering intensity, you can see those god rays start to become more and more prevalent. And in directional light, you can change that, move that around, and the god rays are going to move with it. Uh, and can create some super cool effects. But don't overdo it, of course. But still, you can create some really nifty, cool effects with that um, to mess around with in your scene. All right, so let's block off some sunlight here by adding a few more of those boxes on top here. So we have a bit more of a cave feel going on here. And do keep in mind that these uh, BSP brushes don't have a lot of, uh, well, not a lot, it's not, they don't uh, influence your distance field ambient occlusion. So do keep that in mind. Just take a big rock, scale it up, place that on top here. And this already creates quite a nice scene for us that we can mess around with. And uh, this in combination with those spotlights from earlier, let's turn them back on, uh, will create a nice scene with a lot of uh, interest in the important parts, right? We need to make sure that important areas of our scene are lit well and other areas of our scene are lit less. So we create importance on what parts uh, we need to take into account. I'm just going to turn down the volumetric scattering intensity a bit because it's a bit extreme right now. Um, all right, so those are a few lighting settings that you can definitely use um, to make your scene more interesting. Um, this distance field ambient occlusion can be very powerful, create some super cool effects in your scene, um, some super nice uh, AO in your scene. Um, now I'm, I am going to turn down the directional light intensity a bit because it's starting to get quite bright. Um, and combin combining those uh, automatic effects with some manual spotlights in your scene can create uh, the feeling of something uh, a bit more epic, a bit more 
uh, art directed versus it just being the uh, this the the automatic effects in your scene taking place. So keep in mind use the use both tools at the same time. Use some manual uh, parts. Use some uh, automatic parts together. Uh, they can form something really nice. Um, so ray tracing wise, things that you could do here is when you turn on ray tracing is mess around with the uh, source angle to increase or decrease the softness of your directional light here. That is going to increase or decrease the size of your sun in your sky. Um, so do keep that in mind. Um, also, your ray tracing, one very important thing about ray tracing that a lot of people tend to forget is um, ray tracing is completely unaffected by your uh, box brushes, your BSP brushes. So if you don't have, um, if you don't have, if you have uh, box brushes in your scene or any other BSP uh, shape in your scene, it's just going to get ignored by the ray tracing. It's not going to cast shadows. Uh, it's going to receive shadows from ray tracing, but it's not going to cast shadows. It's not going to cast any ray trace AO. So keep that in mind. Um, if you're having issues with that, with with ray tracing, and it's like not casting shadows for some reason, it could be because there's a box brush in your scene. Um, other things with ray tracing would be that ray traced AO that I talked about earlier that is part of your uh, your skylight as well. In your skylight, you can uh, change the settings for your distance field AO. If you're wondering where to find that, you've got distance field aiming occlusion right here. So if you want to increase or decrease the intensity of that, you can do that. If you want to make everything a nice red color, you can do that as well. Not that I recommend that, but there we go. Um, all right, so I hope that gives you a bit of a step forward into creating cool scenes. I've quickly uh, smashed this together here. It's not a fantastic scene by any sense of the word, but um, it can uh, definitely show you how you can create some cool effects uh, with the settings of your lights here. Um, so remember screen space global illumination. Remember um, the uh, distance field ambient occlusion. Um, remember that you can use spotlights to make stuff a lot more important in your scene to make stuff uh, a, a lot nicer in your scene as well. Um, and use those spotlights to create things like rim lights and stuff like that. Uh, for example, I would put another spotlight on top here on the actual rock uh, facing outward to create a bit more of a rim light for the light that's uh, bleeding inside. Right there. And um, also remember your asset placement. So make sure that your assets fit together. Uh, the Megascans assets are fantastic. They are free to use if you're making an Unreal project. So can definitely recommend you use those. Uh, take a look at uh, Quixel Bridge if you want to download individual assets. Um, they are really nice and very handy to work with as well. I'm going to make this spotlight a lot brighter. Mostly because um, I want to make uh, this rock a lot brighter right here. There we go. And working with these spotlights and adding those gradients uh, can create a lot of extra nice effects in your scene um, and, and definitely give more of a feeling that there's actually light spilling into the scene here like that. These are effects that you don't get for free, that you need to add uh, manually. All right. I hope this has been a help for uh, people that are trying to get started in Unreal Engine uh, and trying to create some cool environments inside of Unreal. Um, this is definitely not an end-all uh, tutorial <laughs> for creating environments, but it's uh, a nice start and maybe I, I hope you've learned something new with the distance field in the occlusion and the screen space coordination. There are some quick settings that you can use to make your scene look a lot better. And definitely don't forget the spotlights. Uh, they are a key factor to making your light look really nice in any environment. All right. Um, Good luck with any environments that you might create in the future and uh, I'll see you in the next video of DIA Vault.